So we have a simple, basic question. How did COVID-19 start? We've asked that question for more than a year and requested that the House majority hold hearings to investigate the origins of COVID-19. Perplexingly, Speaker Pelosi has refused to allow a single hearing, calling it a diversion. As the American people will hear today from our expert witnesses, this is far from a diversion. The evidence continues mounting that this was a man-made disaster that started in the Wuhan lab. Throughout January of 2020, there were 20,000 people from China who were entering the United States daily, exponentially worse than Chernobyl. In short, China lied, the World Health Organization complied, and people died. It's hard to escape noticing that many of the individuals who have been most critical of the lab leak hypothesis, Peter Daszak was mentioned uh, by ranking member McMorris Rogers. Uh, it should be noted that Peter Daszak is a zoologist, not a virologist. Um, anyone that signed that Lancet letter, at least uh, uh, five members of, of who signed that Lancet letter are now on the Lancet's investigation into the origin of the disease, if you can believe it. The chair also has profound conflicts of interest. They have direct and long-standing relationships with Chinese en entities. All these emails happen in 13 hours. So 13 hours after Dr. Fauci gets the initial email from Christian Anderson saying, looks like this virus is engineered, not consistent with evolutionary theory, Dr. Fauci knows some important facts. First, Dr. Fauci knows there's a lethal virus on the loose that started in Wuhan, China. Second, he knows the American taxpayers have funded gain-of-function research in Wuhan, China. Third, he knows that the research grant didn't go through the required oversight board. Fourth, he knows the virus, quote, looks engineered and, quote, not consistent with evolutionary theory. And finally, fifth, Dr. Fauci knows he may have ties to this work in China. His fingerprints, in fact, may be on this. Maybe I'm wrong about all this. Maybe it didn't work out this way. I think I'm right. Maybe it didn't work out this way. But it would have been nice, Mr. Chairman, if Dr. Fauci would come today and answer our questions. He could have come here and defend himself, but he didn't have the courage to do it. And you know else who wouldn't come? Remember that email about the P3 framework? We invited Dr. Hassel to come too. He's the individual who chairs that oversight board. We invited him to come today too, and he wouldn't come. They, they, I, I'm convinced these guys knew right from the get-go what the truth was, and they misled the American people. Oh, here's the other thing. You know that conference call? That conference call? We got the emails regarding the conference call from February 2nd. All these guys, all these guys were emailing back and forth. They were on that conference call. Here's what we got on the FOIA request. Here's all their emails. Every single thing is redacted. Every single thing is redacted about what took place in that conference call, because I'm convinced it was at that conference call where they said, we got to cover our tracks. And again, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. But Dr. Fauci could have been sitting right there and answering our questions, and he wouldn't come today. For most of the pandemic, anyone who raised questions about the origin of the virus was dismissed as some crazy conspiracy theorists. Yet despite the efforts of some of the media, and all of big tech, the World Health Organization, and the Chinese Communist Party, we continue to find increasing evidence suggesting that this pandemic can be traced back to the Wuhan Institute of Virology in Wuhan, China. From the very beginning, Beijing has actively sought to deceive the world on the origin and severity of COVID-19. As the virus was spreading in Wuhan, the CCP silenced whistleblowers such as Dr. Li Wenliang, and censored others who warned about the outbreak. Furthermore, the Chinese government consistently underreported cases and deaths, which continues to this day. What are the chances that the epicenter of the virus, a nation of over a billion people, has suffered around 5,500 deaths and only 120,000 cases? Although we do not yet have indisputable evidence pinpointing the exact origin of the virus that causes COVID-19, I assess that the most likely origin was an accidental infection of laboratory personnel from the Wuhan Institute of Virology with secondary transmission to the local population and subsequent spread to hundreds of millions of people around the world. The WHO investigation published March 1st failed to detect the presence of the virus after testing more than 80,000 wildlife 
livestock, and poultry samples from 31 provinces in China. Moreover, the closest virus found in nature was, quote, several decades of evolution removed from the COVID-19 virus. And we now know definitively that the Wuhan wet market was not the origin of the virus, but was a site of secondary spread. The bottom line is, I believe it is just too much of a coincidence that a worldwide pandemic caused by a novel bat coronavirus that cannot be found in nature started just a few miles away from a secretive laboratory doing potentially dangerous research on bat coronavirus. <laughs> Sometimes the most obvious explanation is indeed the correct one. My main concern for you today, having worked in and around WMD investigations into terrorists and proliferation networks and state adversaries, including China, for over now nearly 30 years of my life, is that we're entering an era of biological warfare. And this is the beginning of a threat level that will affect us for the rest of our lives and probably for generations to come. So how do I believe the COVID virus was taught to infect humans in a laboratory? A commonly, commonly used gain-of-function method to optimize the COVID virus would have been to serial passage in a laboratory on a humanized, genetically modified mouse that can develop a human-like pneumonia. You take 20 mice, you infect them, you wait a week, and then you recover the virus from the sickest mouse. Then you take another 20 and you do it again, and suddenly you're starting to kill the mice. And finally, after several weeks, through this di directed evolution, you'll produce a a mouse that can kill every humanized, a virus that can kill every humanized mouse. Evidence in favor of the natural zoonotic origin, there isn't any. The only evidence that's cited is, well, it looks like another zoonotic uh, case, or those cases are quite common, but there's no scientific evidence uh, supporting those. Uh, the last, I believe, six deaths from SARS were all from lab leaks. There was a lab leak of smallpox um, it's widely uh, assessed that the 1978 pandemic of influenza was probably due to a lab leak. So lab leaks occur even under the best of circumstances because these viruses are adapted to be highly infectious so that only a few viral particles could cause an infection. And particularly with this virus, with so much asymptomatic spread, uh, a person could have spread it to dozens or hundreds or thousands of people before any symptom actually arose. Yeah, I'm not that concerned about gain-of-function research in the United States. I think that some legislation could take care of that. The issue is what do we do about China? What do we do about terrorist groups? I, what we need here is a strengthening of the Biological Warfare Convention, something that demands that we have access to these laboratories and see what's going on. We can cut out all gain-of-function research in the United States. It would do no good if the Wuhan Institute of Virology just closes its doors, doesn't let anybody see what it's doing, and continues on. So we need to have sanctions that will demand that China and other countries be open and accessible and their data be, 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 be transparent. One area is looks like it's designed to plug up the, a hole in the, in the, in the nucleus to, uh, to prevent interferon from coming out. Why is that important? Because then you're asymptomatic. You, you don't sweat and get a fever from the virus, you get it from the interferon. One site looks like it, the spike protein was actually humanized so that the immune system wouldn't recognize it, to make it even harder to make a vaccine against it. Well, I want to make sure I'm correct on, uh, we do not have any evidence that COVID-19 infected any humans and mutated prior to developing the ability to transmit from human to human, right? That is correct. What does the fact that the virus was optimized for human to human transmission tell us about the origins of the virus? Well, again, a natural zoonosis has two processes. It jumps into humans, but it can't it can't do very well. It makes one person sick, or maybe they don't even know they're sick. They, they have antibodies against it, but then it's building up its repertoire. It's, it's learning how to, how to infect humans. And then finally, it takes, and this takes a year to 18 months. Right. So here, it was human to human from the get-go. Right. Um, it, it just, very good. Yeah. And that, that, that simply indicates yes. gain of function. That, that's what it implies. Yeah. The fact that it was human from the get-go implies gain of function. There's no way that we know that that could happen in that. In Which would mean it could only be in the lab, not from That's animal right. to you. Well, That's yes, right. Dr. Anderson predicted that there would be a lot of pre-epidemic uh, blood samples because it was so it was so adapted to humans. 
So when you got zero out of 10,000. Uh, Dr. Muller, how many animals were examined? There were 80,000. 80,000 animals, animals 80, were examined. But there was a set of animals that was never examined, was the humanized mice in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Ah, very good. Very good point. Of those 80,000, how many were found to be carrying the disease? Zero. 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 This is unprecedented because for SARS, in which a much weaker, smaller effort was made, they found the animal within three months. For MERS, in which it was very well hidden in camels, uh, and also a very low effort made, they found it in nine months. Uh, this was a tremendous effort to examine 80,000 animals, from farm animals to wild animals to everything you can imagine, uh, except, as I point out, uh, the, the, the animals in the, in the lab. And, uh, and having zero, uh, if, 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 if this, if, if I can't imagine that the signers of the, uh, of, 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 of the Lancet article uh, would have written the same letter if they had known this. Dr. Girard, why don't you think they're here? Why wouldn't they come? Dr. Fauci and Dr. Collins and Mr. Hassel. Um, you know, I don't know. I know Tony and I, I know Francis uh, pretty well. Um, I, I can't imagine a reason because this is a worldwide pandemic in which millions of people have died. Um, it may have been a result of a lab leak. There will be other, and we think highly likely it is, there will be other pandemics in the future. And if there's something we need, not just Congress, and I know you need it, but the American people in the world needs it, is truth and transparency and openness and trust. And when public officials who are supposed to have our trust don't show up to members of Congress, I think that's a problem. He I'm, showed up everywhere for a year and a half. I mean, you couldn't go, you couldn't go a day. You couldn't go a day and not see Dr. Fauci somewhere. He was everywhere. I mean, he was like, he's like man of the millennial or whatever time de declared him. I mean, he was everywhere. And now, now when we have emails that he's sending out at 12 and 2 in the morning and we have this gain of function that didn't go through the process it's supposed to go through and we have all this, this evidence, suddenly you can't find him. When people learned I was going to come here, uh, I live in Berkeley. I get lots of advice. I get advice not only from my friends and colleagues in Berkeley, but I get advice from all around the country. Yeah. Uh, not one person of all my friends and advisors uh, thought I should come to this committee. So uh, The reason was because it was Republicans. My response to every one of them is I am not going to go and, you know, scientists, yes, they are often biased. You need to distinguish between scientists' opinions and science. And science is nonpartisan. Science is unbiased. Uh, I came here and I told all them I was going to come here and I will talk to anybody. Yeah. And I want to present science because I think in this case, the science by itself carries the argument. We didn't emphasize the threat of biotechnology. So, like, I don't blame our intelligence community. I don't want to hold them to the fire unduly. We didn't tell them this could happen and we should put this at, like, toward the top of the WMD priorities, not toward the bottom. Because Dr. Mueller, one of the great experts on nuclear war in the world, will tell you that it's probably a lot more probable that we'll have a bio war. It's a lot cheaper. And Dr. Quay has even done some estimates on what a bio war would cost versus a nuclear war. It's pretty cheap, pretty effective. And I'm more worried now, not just about China, but about every terrorist crackpot that I've dealt with in the world over the last 30 years coming out of the shadows and trying to get a hold of U.S. technology to program these things on bioreactors on desktop. I mean, Columbia University, not a bastion of conservatism. Columbia University said 60% of the people who died could have been saved had China just said human-to-human -human transmission three weeks sooner. And this group of people, the media and the Dorseys and the... Uh, Zuckerbergs of the world who refused, called it a conspiracy theory. Oh, it's a conspiracy theory. People died. That blood is on the hands of the social media giants and the media and the people who refused and just completely supported whatever China and the World Health Organization said. You have scientists, competent scientists, saying differently and being ostracized. Shame on you.
I, have, I haven't talked about the thing that keeps me up at night the most. So we've talked a lot about China and what its capabilities are and what BSLA-4 labs are and BSLA-3 and that sort of thing. And they're very expensive and they're complicated and there's a lot of equipment and fancy things. But there was a paper in February of 2020, 30 scientists from Switzerland. Uh, they're probably all under 30 in their tennis shoes. And uh, using kitchen equipment, not BLSA 2, 3, or 4, kitchen equipment, um, they were able to order the pieces of SARS-CoV-2 from a, from a supply company, eight different pieces, and in baker's yeast, you know, the stuff you use in your kitchen to make French dough bread on, on Saturdays, they were able to uh, recover, they were able to put these eight pieces together inside the, the sourdough yeast and get it to express SARS-CoV-2. So that scares you a little bit. And then you look at how many times that has been downloaded. And that paper has been downloaded 118,000 times. And I would like someone to look to see if anyone, any terrorists watch lists are on that download list. And as both a physician and a director of public health, I can tell you, Dr. Grar, that the things that you're talking about as conflicts of interest, even as educated as we are, we're still susceptible to peer pressure. We're susceptible to the desire to be published, uh, to be lauded by our peers, to present uh, at confer conferences, and all of these things um, are a type of uh, a pressure and conflict of interest, as you said. Even at universities where I've been on faculty, we were at the point where we could no longer accept a pin from a drug company because it would be a conflict of interest in prescribing a medication. And I can say I've never prescribed a medication because I got a pin. <laughs>